any f***ing movement, if you even so much as sneeze, I'll split your throat. Everything that you've ever wanted to say, I'm sure this will be seen years later, I'm sure we'll all be dead, either dead or in prison. In 2002, in the quiet city of Flint, Michigan, 19-year-old Danielle Taylor was kidnapped by five college students. Travis Paya, Jonathan Cockerell, Jimmy Carwell, Derek Faxlinger, and Christina Lum blindfolded and restrained Taylor, drove her to the woods, and forced her to sit in a grave they had dug. All of it was filmed on camera. They're gonna set you down. As soon as you say one word, I promise you, Christ, you won't say another. We're giving you the chance. For what it's worth, enjoy what you have left. The footage shows the group mocking Taylor, who was clearly distressed and fearful for her life all while being shoveled with dirt and snow. At the end of the film, Taylor is untied, and she is freed. Two days later, she retrieves the tape and hands it to the police. The five friends are arrested and charged with kidnapping and assault. Quite frankly, it was one of the most repulsive, sadistic things I've ever seen in 24 years. According to news outlets, the group of friends simply wanted to produce a horror film. One of them, Jonathan Cockerell, was even studying filmmaking at a community college. But their end result was so crude that it borders on illegal. What could have encouraged the filmmakers to commit and record such a heinous crime? As you might have guessed, It was 1999's classic horror film, The Blair Witch Project. Purportedly comprised of recovered footage, the plot follows three young filmmakers, Heather, Mike, and Josh, as they investigate the terrifying legend of the Blair Witch. The three attempt to document this legend, but things quickly go wrong. Allegedly, all three of them were never heard from again after this incident, and their footage was discovered a year later. Of course, this is all just fiction. The movie was revolutionary, capitalizing on the newly found footage style of filmmaking. While this style is overused nowadays, that wasn't the case in 1999. The film's handheld cinematography, unknown actors, and abrupt ending made people think what they were viewing was real. Not helping matters was the film's over-the-top marketing campaign. Its website included missing persons flyers for the three filmmakers, photos of their abandoned belongings, and a timeline of their whereabouts. Interviews were even staged with the police, news reporters, city locals, and the actor's parents. It's no wonder the film convinced audiences of its authenticity, such as the case with these five filmmakers, who were inspired to make a Blair Witch-style film. The group argued that their victim, Daniel Taylor, was in on the stunt. But Taylor's lawyers disagreed, claiming that she was unaware of their motives. The prank was intended by the participants, but the last party, the victim, was not in on the prank. She pretends to play dead for about a minute. If Taylor truly thought she was going to be buried alive, she would have struggled. The crux of the argument and the actual mystery behind this tape falls on one question. Was Daniel Taylor a willing participant? Or, as a 2009 Stuff article puts it, did Daniel Taylor consent to be taken to the woods in the middle of the night, have a knife held to her throat, and threaten with death?
The tape was likely confiscated by the police and locked up in a vault somewhere, so analyzing the footage was impossible. For a long while, all we had to go by were news reports and small online discussions. But interestingly, MSNBC decided to produce a documentary on the event called The Real Blair Witch. It aired in 2003 and reportedly featured footage from the kidnapping. Despite multiple airings in the following years, the documentary faded to obscurity and became a disturbing piece of lost media. The search primarily took place on the lost media subreddits, where a user named Emerald Spring recalled watching the documentary on TV, but couldn't find much about it online. All that was available was an IMDb page, which repeated much of what was already known, and a trailer on Vimeo. The trailer has just over a thousand views and was posted by Raw TV, a British production company. Given that Raw TV does not mention this documentary on its website, Emerald Spring decided to inquire about it through email. In the meantime, several archived web articles about the incident were found, one of which included a video of the attack, but unsurprisingly, it doesn't work. Also discovered was a WorldCat listing for the film at Brunel University London. This seemed promising, so the library was contacted, but they were unable to help. We do have a copy of the DVD, The Real Blair Witch. However, I'm afraid, copyright law being what it is in the UK, we cannot copy it or send it to you to copy. The license under which we are allowed to purchase and lend DVDs to our staff and students stipulates they can only be used by our staff and students and may not be distributed or loaned to anyone other than a currently enrolled student or currently employed member of staff. Sorry, but I do not think we can help you acquire a copy this way. They were even kind enough to send photos. Besides a listing on NZ Herald, nothing else about this lost documentary was discovered. But interest in finding it was at an all-time high. In July of 2022, a new thread was started by a user named Old Demon reigniting search efforts. This time, Redditors found snippets of the documentary on the Internet Archive. The format is strange. It appears to be the entire program, but broken up into one-minute segments. There is no way to download or stitch them together, which makes viewing the full documentary cumbersome, but possible. The clips were uploaded in 2015, so the documentary was never truly lost, at least not for long. Keep this in mind though, it'll become interesting later. Nevertheless, a different user named Transbian8787 uploaded their personal copy of the documentary to YouTube, complete with opening studio credits and no watermark. This wasn't the same video from the Internet Archive. This was a separate master copy. Curious, I reached out to Transbian 8787, and they explained that they're a freelance contractor hired by various UK and US TV networks to convert digitize, and preserve their work. Having heard of the lost Real Blair Witch documentary from Reddit, Transbian 8787 contacted the original production company, received a copy of the master, and subsequently uploaded it to YouTube. So with all that out of the way, let's take a look at the documentary and see if we can discern whether or not Taylor was in on the act. The program comprises footage from the incident, the court case, and interviews from those involved and their lawyers. We see Taylor in Paya's house before she is, either knowingly or unknowingly, blindfolded, kidnapped, and threatened. This is disturbing at first glance, and implies that Taylor was truly being attacked. But 
take a look at the following scenes. Taylor verbally announces that she is untied, and she even scratches her nose later, despite supposedly being bound. The filmmakers do nothing about this. If this is a genuine kidnapping, surely the kidnappers would have better restrained their victim. But they don't, because, in their mind, this is all just a film. And Taylor is part of it. Four of the five friends, Paya, Cockerell, Carwile, and Lum, drive Taylor to a forest 30 minutes away. Derek Faxlinger stays behind. We never see footage of Taylor entering the vehicle, so it's unknown if she willingly cooperated. Nonetheless, during the drive, Paya tells Taylor to say goodbye to her family. Mom, everybody, I love you. <laughs> I'm sorry for everything. And to you guys, I really don't have much to say to you guys because I can't say nothing. Cockerell holds a knife to Taylor's face. Unbeknownst to Taylor, the sharp tip of the knife is covered by tape. This, according to their lawyers, shows that the group meant no harm and that it was all a ruse. But the tape is extremely thin, and the rest of the knife's sharp blade is uncovered. We can also see that Taylor is clearly distressed and panicking. If this was all just an act, and if Taylor was truly in on it, then she's a pretty good actress. I can't believe that she was scared or anything like that. Thought we was going to kill her with the knife that was taped. <laughs> Taylor is then carried by Paya to the woods, where she is placed in a grave. She lets out one last cry, but it's ignored. Overall, a really disturbing scene. However, there are parts where the make-believe shows. Such as the following scene, where the group is obviously pretending to slit her throat. She's clearly acting, because we know her throat wasn't slit. We know she's not dead, but she pretended, she acted, she went along with the play, as she was doing all along. And, of course, the ending, where Taylor is untied and visibly relieved. Wouldn't the reaction you would expect to be one of anger, one of like, you know, you, with a lot of foul language, I can't believe you guys did this to me, this was a very cruel, cruel and inhumane joke to play on a person. You know, you wouldn't expect them just to be like, oh. I can't remember her name. Daniel. 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 <laughs> anyway. Because he doesn't know her name, I think that that enhances the prosecutor's case that, look, she's not a part of the act. I mean, she doesn't get up and laugh and take a bow herself. She doesn't get her credits, where credit would be very much due if she was acting. Something else that's odd about this case is the time it took for Taylor to go to the police. Why did Taylor wait two days to report the incident? Wouldn't someone who escaped captivity go straight to the police afterwards? Well, unfortunately, it's not uncommon for crimes to not get reported. And according to a Salon article, Taylor only did so after visiting her doctor the very next day, who noticed the bruises on her wrists. Despite this, Taylor was invited by Paya to view a screening of their film at his house. She accepted and used this opportunity to retrieve the tape. The case divided the residents of Flint, Michigan. Some believed the kids went too far with their film, while others were convinced that Taylor must have known beforehand and was simply seeking revenge. Whatever the motive, the five friends were ultimately tried and charged for attempted kidnapping and assault. All of them were eventually freed. This case gets brought up from time to time, and the true motive behind Paya's film and Taylor's actions are hotly debated. But what happened to Taylor and the group afterwards? Well, this is where the whole ordeal becomes strange. Remember how the documentary on YouTube and the fragmented one on the Internet Archive are different? They use the same footage and cuts, but the narrators, text fonts, and even some of the information are different. The UK version concludes with the song Mad World by Gary Jules. I just want this to be over with. 
don't want to be recognized for anything. Just want to go on and live my life and not have people look down up at me because, oh, you're that, you know, kidnapper guy or anything like that. I just want to live my life back to normal, back before all this. I just want to be who I was. In circles, it's a very, very... The U.S. version, however, does not. It actually offers some insights into the aftermath of Travis Paya, Jonathan Cockerell, and Jimmy Carwell. According to this version, the three plead no contest to charges of kidnapping and assault. Paya and Cockerell receive eight months, while Carwell only gets four. After completing probation, their kidnapping charges were removed from their personal record. Unfortunately, it is also revealed that Travis Paya passed away at the age of 24. The documentary does not state the cause of his death, but a My Death Space thread from 2006 reveals the truth. Suicide. Near the bottom of the page are several testimonial blogs from MySpace. None of these have been properly archived, but all three go into Paya's death. As many of you know, Travis Paya, former Cursey grad class of 99, passed away this week. The third testimony, seemingly ran by an angry parent, implies that, quote, a drug overdose is suspected in the death of Travis Paya, awaiting toxicology results. Furthermore, Derek Faxlinger, the fourth man involved who stayed behind after the kidnapping, also passed away. He was just 23 years old. In his final years, Faxlinger reportedly became an organ donor and helped over 30 people through his donations. However, in 2007, he suffered a serious brain injury when he fell and hit his head during an epileptic seizure. The article about his death is unavailable. But when this thread was rediscovered by Reddit, obituaries were found for Paya, Faxlinger, and even Cockerell, who died at his home in 2014 at the age of 32. Three of the five filmmakers involved in The Real Blair Witch have passed away, none of whom reached 40. So what is one to make of all this? I find it extremely difficult to defend these guys, but I really don't think they intended to actually commit a crime. Otherwise, they wouldn't have freed Taylor. They would have gone all the way if that was truly their goal. However, I am by no means excusing their actions. First of all, it's a pretty messed up thing to do, regardless of intent. And second, Taylor's fears look authentic. And any normal person would have realized this and stopped what they were doing. Overall, poor communication and misguided judgment led to a messy trial with a grim aftermath. But that is just what I think. Take a look at the footage yourself and tell me your thoughts. Take care and I'll see you next time.